Our Heavenly Father, our Almighty God, we thank you so very much for the blessings of this day, the opportunity that we have to gather together, to study a portion of your word, to praise your holy name, and above all, to remember the sacrifice of the cross that your Son made in our stead. Father, there are several of our number who are unable to be here. We pray that you would be with them, that if it be your will, they would be returned back to us. Father, we pray for Glenn Schubert at this time and, and uh, the, the sickness that he's going through in, in getting his shot and, and trying to deal with something that, that the world is, is dealing with. Uh, Father, we pray for, for Kenneth, Sherry's uncle, who's uh, dealing with COVID and, and pneumonia. Uh, there are so many. Uh, that are, are dealing with these things. We pray for, for Danny, who's in the hospital with, with COVID as well. Pray for uh, the co-worker of Dawn, whose mother uh, had a stroke, and the mother of the color guard. Uh, it, Father, there's just so many things wrong with this world, and we know that the trials and tribulations of this world are the reason that we have a hope in you, that there is a hope for something better something that this world cannot offer, and that is uh, to be in your eternal glory, in your mercy and your grace, that we might be citizens of the kingdom where we know that, as your word promises, you will wipe away every tear, that there is no more mourning, that there is no more death. Father, as we go throughout this period of study, we pray that all things are done decently and in a proper order, and that your word is lifted up above all else. All these things we pray in your son's most precious name. Amen. So we left off uh, Hosea chapter 5. Well, we finished, uh, finished that up. Uh, I was talking about Ephraim there uh, being oppressed, trampled into judgment. That God was saying he's like a moth to Ephraim and like rot to the people of Judah. And how we discussed how one, uh, it's destructive, but it is prolonged destruction you know if you have a moth in your closet or something it's going to eat at your clothes but it's not going to all eat, eat them all at once and so it kind of slowly nibbles away and destroys that whereas rot uh, represented more of an immediate destruction uh, for the people and then, then in verse 13 of chapter 5 it said when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores and Ephraim turned to Assyria and sent to the great king for help but he's not able to cure you, nor not able to heal your sores. So again, they weren't seeking God. They were seeking help from everyone else, which is not uncommon even today. You know, many people, they have a problem, and instead of casting all their cares on God, as he says to do, it's, well, what can I do to get myself out of this? And they don't think that one of the first things that they can do is pray about it. Or, or to look into God's word about it, or, or what can you do to help me? And, uh, you know, we've heard the phrase, the, the Lord helps those who help themselves. Well, the first way that you can help yourself is to look into God's word and to, and to pray to God. And then uh, in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 5, he's talking about being a lion to Ephraim, a lion. He's going to tear them to pieces. He's going to go away. There's no one to rescue them. He'll return to his lair, verse 15, until they've borne their guilt and seek his face. The idea there being he is like a lion. There's nothing that anyone can do uh, to stop him. Is that their destruction? Uh, it's going to be swift. And when it's done, he's going to return back to his, like a lion to his lair. He's going to be in heaven there kind of waiting on them now we understand that god is omnipresent he is everywhere but there is a sense here that he is not where they are because they have refused to recognize him and if you remember us looking in previous chapters uh, god at one point basically said leave the people alone there's nothing that anybody can do you know until the flames of hell reach them you know, that, that's, that's when they'll figure it out. Did anybody have anything to add to chapter 5? And then we'll read through the 11 verses of chapter 6 and, and get started there. Okay. So beginning in chapter 6, to, to ask first, does anybody want to read? Okay. 
Okay. Ms. Sharon is getting her eyes on, but we are in Hosea chapter 6. Thank you very much, ma'am. So come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. So we can either take these words there in verse 1 as either the words of the prophet to the people, calling them toward repentance, or as the words of the people to one another. Uh, encouraging them, trying to excite them to seek the Lord and humble themselves uh, to before him in hope of finding mercy with him. God said, remember there in verse 15, in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. So now the prophet, the good people, his friends are kind of striking while the iron is hot. You know, the, the people are in the middle of trial. They are in the middle of this affliction. Now is the time to say, this is when you need to seek God. You are at your lowest point. This is when you need to try to seek the Lord and for his mercy so that you can see that. It's interesting. One of the things, I don't know how interesting it is, but interesting to me. One of the things in going through school you know, when you're training to, to be a minister or what have you, whether it's uh, a school of preaching like Brown Trail or Southwest or any of the others, or whether it's uh, somewhere uh, like maybe Freed or, or what have you, but when you're going to, through school for ministry, uh, can you guess when they say one is the most, what is one of the most opportune times to talk to someone about Christ? What would you think? Okay, when they're sick, what was that? Done? Death. That's the number one time when 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 a loved one has, when a loved one has died. They say that that is one of the most opportune times to talk to someone about Christ because they're not focused on anything else but the state of their loved one. Uh, they're focused on eternity. They're focused on why did it happen. They're in the middle of their grief. And so it's, it's a similar idea here in the sense that, you know, it's already been prophesied in their affliction, they're going to seek me. The people are being afflicted. And now it's, we're going to strike while the iron is hot. We're going to strike while they're focused on their affliction and why they, they've turned to Assyria. Assyria can't help them. We're going to focus on that, and we're going to try to get them to turn back to God. We're, we're going to, you know, come, let us return to the Lord. God is the one that has done this. But even though he's done this, he will heal us. Even though he's wounded us, he will bandage us up. He wounded us because of what we did. 
God, he's a righteous judge. He wounded us because of what we did, and now we're suffering for it. So let us go back to him. Because even though he's exacted this punishment on us, he will heal us. He will bandage us uh, up. Those who are disposed to, to turn to God themselves, they should do all that they can to excite other people to do the same thing. You know, when, when, when you are afflicted, when I am afflicted, and when we, when we turn to God, and, and I'll admit there have been times, you know, when I've been through trial and God is the last thing on my mind. Uh, you know, I, I'm human. I'm not thinking necessarily about what can God do. It's okay. How can I get out of this, you know, or how can I fix this? But when, but when we do turn to God and we have that excitement, then we have, as Christians, a responsibility when we see other people in trial to try to excite them to do the same thing. To, you might just replace excite with encourage. Uh, you know, or, or try to lead them to, to doing the, the same thing. Let us go no more to Assyria. Uh, let's return to the Lord. Let's worship him. Let's get rid of all of our idolatries uh, that are there. And, and uh, what, encur- you know, what in- encouragements to do this, they fasten upon to stir one another up. You know, what is it that they're attaching to this as to why the the people need to be stirred up for God? I've said it a couple of times. Right, they're trials, they're afflictions. It's not just we need to turn to God. It's a matter of, again, we are suffering this because of what we have done. God is punishing us for what we have done. So they're connecting the trial and the punishment and what have you with what they've done. And, in, and at the same time, they are attaching the healing to God. Not, not to them, not to Assyria. In fact, they're, they're speaking a, 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 away from that. Let us return to him. He is torn. He is smitten us, uh, your translation might say. We've been torn. Is he that torn us? So let us, let us return, return back. The expectation, though, there is an expectation that we see at the end of part B of verse 1 and part C of verse 1. He will heal us. He will bandage us. So there is an expectation that those who return to God or those who come to God have his, have his favor, if we can put it that way. Uh, I think one of the, probably the most popular episode that we would read in the New Testament would be the story of the prodigal son. You know, leaves home, wastes his life, wastes his money and what have you, and he comes, and he comes back. And the father runs out to to meet him and and gives him the the best uh, that he has because of that one that's returned. That's kind of the idea here, is that you have people who have left the Lord They've joined themselves to Assyria and others. They worshipped these false gods, these idols. Punishment has come upon them. Everything has been taken away. Remember, we would look in chapter 2, and he says, I'm going to take their wheat, I'm going to the animals. Everything's going to be gone. And then it's a matter of let us go back to God because there is the expectation that God accepts those who, who return back uh, to him. And it's the, the same providence of God that, that afflicts peop, his people. It, it relieves them. Any, any thoughts or, or comments on that, either on the providence of God, on their affliction, on turning to God in, during times of trial? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, or we got, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? No, abs- absolutely. Uh, you've heard me probably use this example before, 
uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, who had a PhD in psychology, one of the examples that, that he uh, would use often is a man and a woman conceive a child. And, you know, for those nine months, if it goes to full term, for those nine months, they are, you know, God, I want my child to be healthy. I, God, I want my, this for my child. I want this for my child. And then when the child is born, it's okay, I'll take it from here. Yeah. So, so kind of the, 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 the same idea there in that, yeah, we're, we're not looking for God necessarily, you know, all the time. And we have that affliction there. But he will relieve us, or revive us, excuse me, after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So after two days, that is a short time, uh, in a day or two. And the third day, when it's, remember, uh, if you've been there uh, on Wednesday nights, when we've been talking about John and the raising of Lazarus, uh, remember with the Jews, there was some... You know, to mention Lazarus, there's something particular about that fourth day. Remember, there was the belief first that the person would be buried on the first day. And they believed that the soul would return back to the body for three days. And then when it would start to see kind of the facial features kind of wrinkle up, sag a little bit more and what have you, embalming wasn't necessarily a practice of the Jews, then that fourth day or, or whatever, the, the soul would, would go away. So here, it's after two days, he's going to revive us. The third day, again, it's expected when, when that body should start to, uh, to corrupt and be kind of, you know, out of, out of the sight of the soul. But it says, then he's going to raise us up. We shall live in his sight or live before him. We'll see his face with comfort. He's going to be reviving us there. But it seems to also have further reference as most of the prophets do to the resurrection of Christ. And the time limited expressed by two days, and then what? What about Christ? Raised up uh, on what day? Right, third day. So there's the idea there. There's going to be two days. He's going to revive us up on that third day that we may live before him. You know, our, our series on Sunday mornings, it's been about types and anti-types, and this is just kind of another one of those, in that the people are going to be dead, so to speak, for two days. They're going to be wounded. They're going to be afflicted because of everything that they've done. And then on that third day, uh, he will revive them. They will be healed. They will be bandaged up, uh, so to speak. Um, because, and we consider that because of, let me get over to it here, First Peter, if you are taking notes, First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the, of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So uh, the, all of these prophets that, that we read through, whether it's minor prophets, major prophets, um, they have this spirit of Elijah, this spirit of Christ in them, and they were forever seeking uh, the coming of someone. And so if there is an allusion to that, as we see here, then it's, it's definitely going to stand out. But he says, so, verse 3, he begins there. So let's return to the Lord. Uh, verse 1, he's torn us, he's going to heal us, he's wounded us, he's going to bandage us up, he's going to revive us uh, after two days, raise us up on the third day. So... Because of all of these things, because of these things that I've mentioned before, so let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. Remember what he, what he said before, my people are what? Destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So because he's done these things, because we're punished, 
because of what we've done, he's going to revive us. So for that reason, let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. He, his going forth is as certain as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. Basically, boil it down. We know that if we go back to God, that God's going to be there for us. We know that God accepts those who repent and come. The New Testament speaks of the whole host of heaven singing over one sinner who, who repents. And so they're understanding that. So if we go back to God, he's going to heal us. So because we know that, because he's promised that, and because we can trust in his promises, let us return to him. Let us look to know God. His, his going forth, it's as certain as the dawn. God is one that you can count on. He, even the psalmist speaks, there is one that sticks closer than a brother. Right? Then, so they're going to improve, the, they're going to improve the knowledge of God. Because remember, they're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. When God returns in mercy uh, to his, uh, his people, Isaiah 11 and verse 9 going to be the earth it says will be full of their knowledge Daniel 12 and verse 4 the knowledge shall be increased Jeremiah 31 and verse 34 all shall know God all shall know God we shall know we shall follow to know uh, the Lord so 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 to speak the only way to know God press on to know the Lord the only way to know God is to seek after him. That's it. You, you cannot know God, and I'll say you cannot know God here on this earthly plane. Because we know that you know, man's appointed to die once, and then the judgment, and that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. So everybody's going to meet God at some point. It's just kind of depending on... You know, is it going to be a favorable meeting or an unfavorable meeting? Right? And so, that, but, the, but there are so many who believe that they can know God outside of Scripture. Based on, you know, all these different philosophies and what have you that, that are taught. And that's certainly not the case. The only way to know God is to seek after God. Uh, Jeremiah 31 and verse 34. Jeremiah 31, uh, 34. Uh, the others were Isaiah 11 and verse 9, and then Daniel 12 and verse 4. Any thoughts or comments so far? So then what shall I do with you, verse 4, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. So in the previous uh, progression of the text as we've been going through this, this book, uh, Judah was brought down to Israel's uh, level of depravity. And this particular verse, verse 4, it introduces uh, the two together in equality in this kind of hollow devotion that they have to God. Right? One, uh, one was kind of separated it off, and now they're included together in that they are both uh, undevoted. You know, what can I do? It's a cry uh, of frustrated love uh, that, that he has uh, for these people, of their refusal to return and, and pursue the knowledge of him. And so this is this verse is it's actually where we see the attitude behind the the sudden shifts of a a harsh judgment and a complete pardon in the book. What shall I do with you, Ephraim? What shall I do with you, Judah? This this is how your loyalty is. It is God being frustrated. You know, we have revelation. You know, you're neither hot nor cold and spew, I spew you out of my mouth. Here, it's kind of the same thing. Is that, What am I going to do with you? I've been gracious to you. I, I, I have now punished you for your wickedness. You have these hollow devotions for me. You're like a cloud that just kind of passes by. 
you know. And it just kind of cha la 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 la, just kind of moving on. You know, you're like the dew. I, I could even say like a like a summer rain in Texas. It can storm for two hours, and inside of ten minutes, the streets are dry. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how these people are. It's like, what am I going to do with you? He's just so frustrated with them. Because remember, even up to this point, he has provided so much for them. And yet they still don't seek him. It's, it's so interesting. And we can make connections to us or to the, to the people of today as to how much God has provided, how much a person has been blessed with. And yet... They either take it for granted, or they don't care, or they don't uh, recognize that it comes from God. And I'm sure that there are some who don't know that it comes from God. I'm sure there's plenty of people who don't know that it comes from God, maybe because they haven't been taught, or, or whatever the case may be. And it's just this frustrated love that, that he has for him. You know, clouds and dew, of course, describe a feeling that's fleeting. They're unsteady in their love. Uh, which we know about these people, especially from uh, looking at the book of Judges. And so for this reason, therefore, verse 5, for this reason, because of the way your fleeting love for me is, like this morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early, for that reason I've hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I've slain them by the words of my mouth and the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. So it's explaining these judgments that have already been afflicted through, through God's agents, through the, the prophets, and not just Hosea, but other prophets as well, who have been faithfully and fully explaining what God has done and why he has done it. God takes these faithful men, and there have been women in Scripture as well, who have acted as judges, to go to the people and just forcefully proclaim, this is what has happened. This is why. This is why you must turn back to God. When you turn back to God, this will happen. You know, one plus one equals two type of thing. You didn't care. You went to worship idols. You were punished for it. But if you recognize why and you return back to God, then you will find grace and favor among God again because God is like that. He is as consistent as you can be. Again, he's one that you can re rely on. In fact, the link between the prophets and God is so intimate that... Their very words constitute the, this, this hewing, this kind of hacking away, you know. Um, I, I think maybe the best way to, to see this idea in the way that they feel about the words, you ever hear a sermon and then... You know, maybe you've even told the preacher afterwards, or maybe not, but you felt like the, worm, the sermon stepped on your toes. You know, it's like, wow, you really kind of stepped on my toes this morning, or, or something like that. That's biblically defined hacking, you know, is that they have used the words of God so forcefully that for particular people, because let's face it, one person might feel their toes stepped on, another person won't, right? But uh, that, that's how that person felt. Only to the nth degree, because it wasn't just a matter of personal feeling, but it was also a matter of food has been taken, famine has come in, you know, animals have been taken, and, and, and what have you. But, but that's kind of the idea there. When he's saying that the, the prophets, there in, in verse 5, uh, that I have hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I have pricked their hearts, you know. And just like today, some people are affected by it, some people aren't. There are some people, I'm sure, listening to Hosea or heard Hosea, who walked away saying, you know what, I did not get anything out of that. <laughs> you know, 
We're just kind of, eh, whatever, you know, he's talking to the air, or, I mean, just think of some of the things that we might even hear today. Who is Hosea to be standing up here talking to me? He married a prostitute. Come on. I mean, really, who's he to talk to me? Or, or Hosea's not perfect. You know, he, he's not God. Or, is he done talking yet? I was asleep. You know, so I mean, it's kind of the same idea here. The Hosea's words, they're general enough still to embrace a whole line of prophets. You know, from, from Moses and Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, they're general in that they are meant for all of the people. It's not calling one particular individual out. You know, it's everybody. And um, let's see here. The resemblance between verse 6 here and 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22 suggests that the first prophet slash judge might be in view. Uh, 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of uh, rams. So it's possible that Hosea, in speaking these words delivered to him by God, is, is, uh, is having the entire line of prophets in view all the way back to what Samuel uh, has said there in 1 Samuel uh, 15, 22. Because he comes here in verse 6, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. There, there is a, a disposition in every person. At least I believe there is. Maybe you disagree, and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, in every man to substitute external observances or things that, that we do externally uh, for the devotion of the heart and they they rest in being satisfied with serving God externally but not internally and and what I mean by that is uh, we might look at it as well you know what I uh, I serve on the communion table or I lead singing or I lead prayers or uh, I do Wednesday night meals, or I help out with mission printing. You know, all of these external things, and they're satisfied with that, and yet internally, they're not focused on, on God at all. That, that, that particular individual, just using those as, a, as examples, is that God, uh, you know, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. I delight in who you are Inside, Yes, those outside things, they're important. James writes, faith without works is dead, right? So it takes both of them. But God says that ultimately, ultimately it's who you are to me on, on internally. Who you are to me inside. Are you loyal to me in your heart? Remember, man is the one looking at the outside appearance. God is the one looking at the heart, Right? Who are, it doesn't matter if we do everything right on the outside if we don't have a heart and a mind focused on God. Well, what did Christ say to the young lawyer with, based on, on a text in Deuteronomy? Love the Lord your God with all your, not material possessions, but what was the first thing listed? Heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Again, yes, the physical things, doing things, for the church in helping our brothers and sisters is right. It, James would say, if you have someone who comes to you and they're hungry and you just say, you know, here, be warm, be filled, you know, you haven't really helped them at all. Right? We ha and that's kind of the, the, the idea here behind verse 6. I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Yes, those things are important, but let's face it, not everybody can do those things. And here's what I mean by that. What if you have a physical disability that stops you from doing some external things? Or a mental disability? You know? If God had said the reverse, 
I prefer you to do, you know, I, I, I delight more in you doing these external activities than I do how you are in your heart. Well, then where does that leave the people who are paraplegics? You know, or some people who can't do physical activities to help the church, right? It, it leaves them kind of out in the cold. But every living, breathing person has a heart. And a heart that can trust in God. And yes, I understand, you know, trusting in God is more than just giving over your heart. You know, we need to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins and what have you. I understand that. That's not what we're talking about here. Is delighting more in who, who I am to you in your heart, in your mind, in, in your very soul. Yes, the externals are, are, are important, sure, but, but so much more is, is how it is. A couple, you know, God is not mocked, Galatians 6 and, and verse 7. Another verse that you might want to write down, you know, looking at the heart, not the outward appearance, only 1 Samuel 16 and, and verse 7. Um, they're not... There's kind of the idea there in Scripture says not to labor for the meat that perishes, but for the meat that endures uh, into eternal life. Same idea. You know, don't just seek after physical things and, and what have you. Um, look, look more to, toward the spiritual. You know, the flower fades, the grass withers, or the grass withers, the flower fades. Either one, they're going to wither and fade. But the word of God stands forever. Right? The word of God has been here before we were born. The word of God is going to be here after we die. You know? Any closing thoughts or, or comments? Okay, let's have a quick prayer. And, and then we'll end and we'll pick up. We'll finish up talking about verse 6. And then go through the rest of the chapter next week. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the time that we have been able to spend in the study of your word and looking at the prophet Hosea. Father, we pray that as we look to the people of the Old Testament at this time, that we would see some of ourselves in them and what we can do to strengthen one another and encourage one another to, to follow a righteous path that we might drink from the deeper wells. Father, as we go throughout the worship to follow, we pray that all things are done decently in a proper order and that you are glorified and that we are pleasing in your sight. In Christ's holy name, amen.